Welcome back, everybody, to the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. We're on Chapter 2, and I'm really honored to be teaching with my good friend, Janice Sanders. She's such a high practitioner. She's always keeping in mind how she can be kind, how she can make better seeds by changing old habits. So just getting the chance to be around her is always great. So we're actually here together uh, live teaching, but there was some mix-ups with the Zoom. So we're recording these first two classes for you. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to catch you live uh, for class three. So let me get started. This second class is um, on the first chapter, I believe, as uh, Janice has outlined the 10 chapters for us. And just as a review, she also gave us the story of Master Shanti Deva's life and what a high practitioner he was, so high that he floated up off of his throne and, and floated away. So we might not have that ability yet, and that's okay. Uh, the idea here is that we want to slowly or quickly change our world until we can be like Master Shanti Deva and really make a big impact on the whole world around us. So this class number two, as the first chapter of Master Shanti Deva's book also is a sales pitch. This is the chapter where we get you excited about wanting to become a bodhisattva. What is a bodhisattva and why would we want to put the effort in? How can we inspire you? How can Master Shanti Deva inspire us to want to become bodhisattvas? So I'm going to start off with one of the verses from his book, The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. What kind of goodness could there ever be other than the wish for total enlightenment that could overwhelm those negative deeds of dreadful and awesome strength? Janice started talking about this a little bit too, about how we have an expiration date. That's one of the problems that we have. But in my world, I see a lot of other problems going on. For instance, violence in the world, people hurting each other. And out in the news, we hear really horrible stories that are just unimaginable cruelty and violence going on, different groups hurting each other. And even in our own town, we see people who are living in extreme poverty, living on the streets, having all kinds of problems. And even in my own heart, when I have a good life, the food and shelter that I need, even people around me who care about me and I love, I have sadness sometimes and pain in my own heart. And that's what this course is all about, is that we have to change our own heart if we wanna change the world around us. So let's take a look about at what the word bodhicitta means. A bodhisattva is the embodiment of bodhicitta. It's what they are on the inside, in their heart. And the word uh, in Tibetan, which can sometimes give us some good clues as to what this word really means, is jangchub semki. That's the Tibetan. And I'm, I'm not a Tibetan scholar, I'm not a Tibetan speaker, but I want to be able to give you some words in case you are someone who's going to become a Tibetan scholar. So forgive my pronunciation for those of you who already are working on it, or maybe you're already born, naturally good at Tibetan. So uh, what this meaning of bodhicitta is, in the translation, the direct translation is enlightened and mind developed, jangchub semki. Um, what it means is that we have the um, wish, right? So uh, we're going to give you a definition of that wish here a little bit later. It comes in a, a couple of slides. Um, but there's a, a wish that we could be that person, like Master Shantideva who could help, who could feed everybody out of a bowl, who could make a difference in the world, who could really help people. 
And the way that we do that is by developing our own enlightenment and our own enlightened mind. In order to be able to understand why having bodhicitta is so important, we need to do a little review about the five paths or stages of spiritual development that everybody goes through. The five paths, the word paths really means a realization. So we have these different steps that happen in order for us to get from being a uh, being who is um, suffering and unhappy, having a lot of problems, uh, getting sick, dying, uh, having everything wear out, all the good things in our lives wearing out. How do we get from there, plus seeing everybody in our world going through those same things, to that being who can really help everybody? We'll take a look at that. So before we get to the first path, though, let's talk just a little bit more about what life is like before we get on any of these paths. For me, you know, when I was very young, I had a lot of, my heart was soft. I had a lot of compassion. And actually my father told me before he died, just a year or two before he died, when he was quite sick, he told me that he remembers when I was four or five years old, that we were driving in Arizona out in the desert and I was looking out the window and I just turned to him and I asked him, dad, why do people hurt each other? You know, and that really touched me when he told me that, because I don't remember that, but I know I had this tenderness, this very tender heart. But as I got older, I became sort of overwhelmed by the pain of life. My Mother particularly would tell me, you know, don't be a crybaby. So if I was too tender, if I was upset about the small pains in life, I would get reprimanded, reprimanded. So I developed a hardness about myself and I wasn't very happy. So I started looking for things to make me happy outside of myself. I started chasing after um, people, you know, I wanted girlfriends to make me feel better. Then I wanted boyfriends to make me feel better as I got older, um, trying to get happiness from people outside of myself. Of course, many of us probably have food, trying to be happier by eating cake. One of my good friends has that. <laughs> as a cake is a metaphor really for all of those things we crave. Uh, we go around thinking all day long that if I could have this or if I could have that, I will feel better. And we start becoming very self-centered, like trying to constantly take care of our needs to try to get pleasure. And for me, unfortunately, that led at quite a young age to cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs. And that took up a big chunk of um, years of my life that I wasted chasing after pleasure in these outside things. And of course, they didn't make me happy. Uh, they made my life worse. Uh, they made me unhealthy. Uh, they didn't even make me feel good temporarily anymore at some point. And I just only was left with the problems that they caused. So that's what happens to many people before we even get on these paths. So let's look at the first path, accumulation. The path of accumulation is when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. It means that we realize that we can't find happiness out in outside things, that everything we care about wears out. And we just come to a point, which you can call renunciation, where things just we things aren't working. We see that we're in a broken world. We see it's not working. This is a really important phase for a person who's interested in changing themselves and the world. Because this is the phase where we start to realize there's something wrong and we want to change it. You know, some people never get to that point. They just continue to spend money. Maybe they have a lot of money. They get more yachts or more houses. And, you know, are they really happy? I don't know. 
But for me, um, this is a definitely an important part of my path is getting sick and tired of being sick and tired and realizing that chasing after things that I want, trying to push away things I don't want, it's not working. It's not making me happier. One thing about this first path is it's something that you'll probably revisit. Uh, it's not something you just finish off and it's done because I still am going into the refrigerator or the freezer looking for ice cream. And it doesn't mean that you can't have ice cream, but if you're thinking that that ice cream is gonna make you happy, then uh, that's something that we wanna keep working with. So then the next path is the path of preparation. And in this path, we start to learn how we can change. And hopefully we're fortunate enough to meet a teacher as Janice and I have. We've been studying together now for over 10 years in ACI. And both of us studied before that as well in various yoga and Buddhist traditions and other traditions. So we've accumulated some tools. And I think that when we heard uh, Geshe Michael's explanation of the pen and dependent origination or interdependence, how things work, it really started to make sense to us. And then we had the path that we needed to prepare our minds for the third path. So hopefully you're already on the third path. I am not because the third path is very specific. We might spend a lot of time in the first two paths. And this is the third path is a jump to another level. So we're preparing by teaching this class, by sharing this class with you, by you listening to the class, we're both preparing for this next step, which is the path of seeing. The path of seeing is very specifically means that we see emptiness directly. If there's anyone out here uh, watching who hasn't studied emptiness yet, I think it's important right now that we make sure we understand what emptiness is. It's a very specific thing. So I'll just quickly go through the presentation of the pen Traditionally, this was done with a conch shell. And a conch shell, big seashell, can be used for different purposes. And that's why it's used for this de demonstration traditionally. But we don't have conch shells around anymore. Uh, the old teachers of old in the temple, it was one of the items that might be sitting around uh, in, the, in the temple. Uh, so Geshe Michael, in his wisdom, had has taught the same ideas using the pen. So I'll ask a couple of questions. Janice will help answer, hopefully. What is this thing? Pen, pen. That's right, it's a pen. And what if a puppy dog comes in and I offer this thing to the puppy dog? What will the puppy dog do? Chew on it. Right, so does the puppy dog see a pen? They don't see a pen. No, they don't see a pen, they see a they see a chew toy, something to chew on. So let me ask you, who's right? The human who sees the pen or the puppy dog who sees the chew toy? Well, I think they're both right. Janice says that they're both right because the puppy dog can chew on the pen and get satisfaction and I can write a love letter to my boyfriend. So they're both right, equal rights. Now, this is the important part of this demonstration is if I put this stick on a table and everybody leaves the room, all of the people, all of the puppy dogs, all of the flies, and no one's in the room, at that time, what is this thing? Oh. I don't know. We give, we give the universal shrug. So when no one is looking at this thing, we can't say, is it a pen or is it a chew toy? But if the human comes back in and they see this pen, stick, what is it then? It's a pen. That's right. And if the puppy dog walks in and they see this thing, then what do they see? Something to chew on. That's right. So the the um, reality of this stick, what it is to each individual is coming 
from the person observing it. It's not coming at the person or the dog. Otherwise, we would all see the same thing. Okay. So the emptiness is when nobody's looking at it. What is this thing? So I'm going to stop there for a moment. There, there's more to the story about the pen, where it really is coming from. We're going to talk a little bit more about seeds later. But the important thing is to understand that the object doesn't have any inherent value from its own side. Sometimes we use a yelling boss. I know when you look at the yelling boss, one person sees the yelling boss as a jerk. Someone else sees the yelling boss as finally giving a, the um, other person in the office what they deserve. So we're all seeing something different. And that's what emptiness is. There's nothing already there occupied from its own side. Seeing emptiness directly is a very specific circumstance where we're in a deep, deep state of meditation. And for about 20 minutes, we actually leave the desire realm where we're chasing after things, always trying to get something. And our consciousness is able to perceive a higher reality that there is nothing that's not coming from our own projections. It's an experience that's very hard to describe and I haven't done it, but I can tell you that they say that there is no um, concepts during that time. You can't even think I'm seeing emptiness directly during that time. It's like water being poured into water. That lasts about 20 minutes. Now, if you have bodhicitta, and that's why we're going through this, if you have bodhicitta at that time, you have some very special things that happen uh, about your heart opening. So we're going to get into that a little bit more later. But let's finish with the five paths first. The fourth path is after the this 20-minute experience, there is the path of habituation. And this traditionally is said to take seven lifetimes of getting used to what you saw. You saw that things are not coming at you, but the whole world is coming from you, from the projections of your karma, forced on you by your past thoughts, words, and deeds. And it takes a while to get used to that and to change your behavior. Luckily for us, we can start changing our behavior just based on the intellectual understanding we don't have to wait till we see emptiness directly. We can try to change just based on understanding it. So that's habituation. That goes on uh, for seven lifetimes or less. They say you're on a conveyor belt. You're going to definitely make it to this next stage, this fifth path, which is called no more learning. It comes in importantly again now, whether you have bodhicitta or not, because you don't have to have bodhicitta to get to no more learning. It would be called nirvana in a lower enlightenment or nirvana if you're not a bodhisattva. But if you are a bodhisattva and you've gone through this process of developing bodhicitta, then you become a Buddha. That's my sales pitch. We need to have bo bodhicitta. We need to be a bodhisattva so we can get to total enlightenment, which is Buddhahood. And Buddhahood is an incredibly important place to reach because we have an omniscient mind and we'll know exactly how to help people. Uh, we also have a body that can go out to a billion places at once. So not only do we know how to help people, but we can go directly to them. And if they're ready and they want help, then we can help them. Those are just a couple of qualities of Buddhahood that are attractive. So let's get to that definition of bodhicitta. This definition is according to Lord Maitreya. And this is one that you should memorize. If you're doing your homework, it's on your homework and quiz, I believe, as well. It's easy to memorize, and it's a really important thing to keep a, an idea about what it is and think about it. So bodhicitta is the wish to achieve total enlightenment in order to help all living beings. The wish to achieve total enlightenment 
in order to help all living beings. In Tibetan, that's Semke Pani Shendun Chir Yangdak Sokpe Jang Chudu. We're going to talk more about what this means. Why is this so powerful? But it begins to give you this sense of this quality that we want to develop. If you are someone who wants to help others, and I suspect most of you listening to this, if not all of you are, you want to help others, not just people, but animals and all the beings that we share this world with. You have to know what to do. And if you're like me, we don't know how to make things better. So the way to be able to make things better is to become a Buddha, because then we'll know. We'll know how to help. So that's why these two things go together. Wanting to help fuels our journey of going to the highest state that we can. And also, trying to get to that higher state gives us the ability to help people along the way, which helps to create the causes for us to keep going higher and higher, creating an upward spiral. We're going to talk just a little bit more about the two parts of the path of seeing. This isn't on your homework, uh, but Geshe Michael talked a lot about this when he originally taught this class in the 1990s. And um, so I just wanted to make sure to impart with you the information that he also thought was important about becoming a bodhisattva. So when you see emptiness directly on the path of seeing, which is the third, the three paths, you become an Arya. That's the name of it, someone who's seen emptiness directly. It's also sometimes known as a stream enterer. And Arya, the word Arya in Sanskrit actually means like noble one. And uh, yeah, so, oh, my name, I was going to say, my name, Alex, means noble in, uh, you know, wherever you look up on the internet, what does your name mean? And, and uh, apparently that has to do with uh, the same definition. So I thought, oh, good, that's a, <laughs> a good sign. I can make it to become a stream enter where I'm on the conveyor belt and can't be stopped from reaching my final goals. In Tibetan, that's nyamshat yeshe. And then what happens after, which is also on the path of seeing, is called the aftermath. And this is where I'm going to give you a little bit more details about the direct experience of bodhicitta. So if you've been trying to cultivate during your path of preparation bodhicitta, if you've used the information in the Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life to start changing your heart, when you have the direct experience of emptiness, you right after, while you're still sitting on your cushion, will have the direct experience of bodhicitta. So you have to be in the Mahayana track, the track to reach total enlightenment by going through this path of the body, Bodhisattva to have this experience. And it is said that what happens in that moment is uh, almost a physical experience of feeling your heart bursting open and seeing the beings, not only on this world, but in the entire universe, seeing each one and knowing that you're going to be the one who can help them. It's a feeling which I can't describe because I've never had it, but I want to give you a small example of a little tiny glimpse of bodhicitta that I've had uh, a, a couple of times, and maybe you have too had something like this. I had a very sad experience happen a couple of years ago where my dog got run over by my friend. We were just, you know, at parked. We were just, our cars were parked, our dogs were around and she got in her car to move her car. And my dog was run over, who I had a lot of um, love for. We were very close, my dog and I. And when I realized that uh, my dog was dead and I couldn't rush her to the vet, which was what I was going to do, what, then I went to like rush her to the vet, but she wasn't alive anymore. I couldn't rush her to the vet. And my friend was 
just so I could see how distraught she was. And, uh, you know, I just put, I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to do anything, but I just gave her a big hug and you know, told her it's, you know, it's okay. And uh, I had so much compassion for her, even though I had lost a loved one, but my, my heart opened to her pain and her, um, you know, just the, the distraught feeling that she had from having killed this dog and her friend's dog. So that's just like one example of where it's spontaneously wanting to comfort and help somebody. So it's a tiny example of what it could be like. And you know, it felt very beautiful because it was in a moment of sadness and grief, but it felt like this huge moment of like peace and love. And so I think that this feeling of um, direct experience of bodhicitta is something we can't really describe even maybe if you've had it, but certainly if you haven't, but just try to imagine some type of immense love for all beings that just fills you with peace, and joy. So that happens. And then there's um, more in the aftermath, which is called Jeito Yeshe, which happens for about 24 hours. And during this 24 hours, we experience the four Arya truths, uh, which each of the four has four. So there's these 16 different experiences we go through. And this, this course isn't really um, geared toward teaching that, but there are some things about it, the direct experience of bodhicitta, which are very uh, critical to, that's when you really become a bodhisattva. Until then, we we'll, we'll want to be bodhisattvas. We're trying, but when you have this experience, then you, you are a bodhisattva. And you also know, you see during that time, how many future lives you'll have before you reach your total enlightenment, before you reach Buddhahood. You lose all doubt in the path. Uh, you know that there is a way to do it, and you know that you're going to do it. So those are just a few of the amazing things that happen on the path of seeing, which will totally transform you. But we have to have that uh, de developing bodhicitta so that we can see emptiness directly. As Janice said, that's our goal. Seeing emptiness directly is the gateway to start this conveyor belt process to Buddhahood. As if we have bodhicitta, we reach Buddhahood. If we are on a different track, we reach Nirvana. I think there's some uh, slide about nirvana, which I can share with you later. Oh, here, it's the next topic here. There's two options um, for the path of no more learning. One is nirvana, which makes you an arhat. And an arhat is somebody who has permanent, permanently ended their mental afflictions. No more disturbing emotions forever, just done. So that's something that we all will do even if we're going on to Buddhahood. We, we have to reach that, that moment where we've ended all of our negative mental afflictions. And one other thing that's cool to know about reaching Nirvana is you might not look any different. You could reach Nirvana today or you might have already reached it yesterday and you would still be in this body, in this place but you would be a completely transformed. Your mind would be completely transformed. Whereas the option two, for those of us who are going to be reaching Buddhahood because we have bodhicitta, remember this is a sales pitch about why you wanna be a bodhisattva, um, your body completely transforms into a body of light that doesn't get sick, doesn't die, and can emanate to help everybody everywhere. And your mind, uh, you end all the obstacles to omniscience so that you have that mind that uh, knows how to help people, knows everything in all three times, they say. So here's another homework question. There's two forms of the wish for enlightenment. So remember the definition of bodhicitta, the wish to reach total enlightenment for the benefit of all living beings. That wish can have two kinds. 
So that's the definition of bodhicitta, the wish for enlightenment, short definition, very short. And um, it's also sometimes just called the wish. So there's two ways you can have the wish. One is the wish in the form of a prayer. And this is said to be like getting ready for a trip. Right? If you wanted to go to Hawaii, first you would have to check out you know, where you were gonna stay, how you were gonna get there, learn all the details about what you wanted to do when you were there. And you start visioning it in your mind that, that that's where you wanna go. So that's in the form of a prayer. There is a uh, ceremony you can take to commit yourself to bodhicitta in that form. It's called juksem in Tibetan. And it's like planning your trip. But then uh, when Geshe Michael was teaching this class, he said that what it really means traditionally is after you've had that direct experience of bodhicitta that I was just talking about, you have the direct experience of emptiness, then you have the direct experience of bodhicitta, then you know that you wanna do it, you know you can do it, but you haven't actually done it yet. So that's the prayer, I'm going to do it, I know how to do it, I want to do it. Um, so you know you can do it. And then the next part is during the path of habituation, although we're all starting now, uh, even before we get to the fourth path. we we'll start on the second path. Uh, and that's called um, the wish in the form of action. And this is working on the six perfections. Munsem. We're actually taking the trip now and we're applying the six perfections to our lives. The chapters of this book, The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, uh, they go along with the six perfections. And Many of you probably know what they are, right? There's the perfection of sharing and giving. There's a perfection of ethical life. Perfection of not getting angry is the third one. These sound familiar. They're the chapters that Janice went through. The perfection of joyful effort, the perfection of meditation, concentration, and the perfection of wisdom. So this book that we're studying is going to help us know how to do the wish in the form of action. What actions can we take in our lives right now? And this is what Geshe Michael asked us to think about. This is how we start this um, prayer or wish in the form of action. What could I do at this moment that would be the most help to people? And we start thinking about that all day long. That starts becoming our motivation rather than what can I do to give pleasure to myself, like cake or alcohol or cigarettes or finding more friends. Instead of always looking at how we could have nicer clothes or take care of ourselves, we spontaneously start looking at what would be the most help to other people. How can I spend my day? How can I spend my time to help others? And it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have nice things. I think that's an important thing to remember on the um, path of renunciation that I mentioned earlier, or the um, accumulation is the official name as the first path. It's not that we can't enjoy nice things and have pleasant things in our lives. It's thinking that they are self-existent, that they're coming from their own side that causes us the suffering. So we learn through studying this book that things are coming from us. And that's the next topic. So we talked about the pen a little bit and we'll talk about that again. But the definition of karma is movement of the mind and what it makes us do. So we have to talk a little bit about karma, good karma and negative karma because that's how we're going to be able to change who we are right now into someone who can help others and who can even want to help others. It comes from our seeds, it's forced on us. So let's go back to the pen for the, the second half of the pen. We established that whatever being looks at this shape and colors is going to 
see it as something specific based forced on them from their seeds. So that's how the pen is created for me. Maybe I shared a pen in the past. And when I gave a pen to someone, it actually made an impression in my own mind, recorded it. It's like the um, mind is a video recorder. It's recording everything that you ever think, say, or do. And then those karmic seeds are inside your mind stream and they're uh, waiting for the right causes and conditions to come out. And then when the cause and condition is out here and uh, my seed ripens at the same time, thankfully I have a pen when I need one, hopefully. So that's a basic description of what karma is. It's recording what we see and that stews around and then comes back out and lays itself onto my computer, onto my water bottle, onto my good friend Jay over there. Uh, everything, the seat I'm sitting on, everything is like the pen. Every being is gonna see things differently. No two people, much less no two uh, different kinds of beings see things the same way. That's the information that we need to be able to change the world. That plus the other half, which is the emptiness. And the analogy there is like a blank screen. So our mind is projecting. First, the mind recorded. Okay, so it's a recorder and it's a projector. And because the world is blank, like a white blank screen, it's available for me to project my recording onto it. If it was already occupied by Janice's recording, then I would have to see the world the way Janice sees it or the way my dog sees it. And as, as we know, <clears throat> the dog sees poop as something to roll in, for instance, <clears throat> that happened today. But I don't see poop that way. Otherwise, I'd have to roll in the poop too. <laughs> And that would be bad. So it would be bad for my friends because they'd have to smell me in the car. <clears throat> so when we understand, when we begin to understand about karma, then we know that what we need to do to change our world is to take up good actions and give up the negative ones. And this, back to the sales pitch, bodhicitta, this witch is perfect karma. It's the perfect good seed to plant. So the more time in our day we have in mind that I want to reach total enlightenment for the benefit of every being, the more good seeds we're planting with every action we take. I can brush my teeth thinking that I want to be able to help other people by having sweet words and seeing myself help other people by teaching this class will help me reach my goal of total enlightenment. So I'll really be able to help. So small actions all day long done with bodhicitta are the perfect karma that we can be planted. Here's another quote from uh, Master Shantideva. All other good deeds are like the plantain tree that gives its fruit away and dies. That I'm sorry, let me read it clearly. That gives its fruits and always dies away. The wish for enlightenment, though, is an evergreen that never dies by giving its fruits, but rather ever increases. So this verse from Master Shanti Deva's book gives us that sense of how bodhicitta is a self-perpetuating upward spiral. It just starts growing into this beautiful energy that will help us reach all our goals. And that brings us to uh, another homework question. It's homework question three. There's some beautiful metaphors that Master Shanti Deva uses to help us understand bodhicitta a little bit better. The first one he says is that the wish is like an alchemical elixir, which can, which can change our inferior body that we have now into the supreme body of a Buddha. We already talked about how this body gets sick, it dies, it has problems. And if we can make it through the four paths to the fifth path, 
path of no more learning with bodhicitta, then we reach Buddhahood. And the Buddha has a light body, a body that never has pain and is always able to help others. So that's how the wish can change our body. And the second metaphor is that the wish is like a precious jewel, which is difficult to find and able to clear away the poverty of living kind. So this is interesting because is it saying that there won't be any poverty if we have bodhicitta or even if we become a Buddha? Well, I still see, I still see poverty in the world even though there are Buddhas. And that's a, a classic question that is asked in the, um, on the debate ground, I guess. Uh, it's been debated in the coffee shop with my friends. And uh, the answer is that it depends who's looking. But maybe for the bodhisattva who has achieved bodhicitta, there won't be any more poverty in living kind because of the way they see the world with, with love and the way a Buddha sees the world. So why is it like a precious jewel? Because we can wish for anything. It's difficult to find this precious jewel. Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe it didn't say wishing jewel. I was, I was gonna talk about the wishing jewel, but it just says that it's a precious jewel, difficult to find. So it's, the analogy is that it's so um, rare so rare, and then when we find it, it can clear away all the poverty. And then the third one is that it's like an evergreen tree, and that was the verse that we did on the last slide. It keeps bearing fruit. The, the goodness never ends because every time we have the wish, it's self-perpetuating, increasing the goodness, so more goodness comes. Instead of wearing out, it grows. And the fourth one, the wish is like a great warrior who's able to protect one from great fear and danger. And so I have this firefighter here who is kind of a warrior protecting others. And it's nice to think of that analogy as of a warrior. We talk about peacock warriors or people who are on the path of the six perfections. So we, we're not a warrior in the sense of being violent, or angry, or hurting anybody. We are um, developing this ability to be powerful in protecting others. And how do we protect others? By changing our own karma. When we stop creating negative karma and start creating good karma, we change our own heart and mind and we change the world around us, eventually becoming a Buddha who can really protect others. I think there's one more. So now uh, my same picture is an analogy for this fire. It's an image of the fire. The wish is like the fire, which comes at the end of an eon. They say that the world, the world's end in a, in a giant fire that burns everything away in the ancient texts. It says that and but instead of burning away the world, this fire of bodhicitta is able to burn away all your bad deeds without any difficulty at all. If you're like me, even in this time of life, my lifetime that I can remember, I've done many bad deeds, many negative things. And those negative things are what are ripening, and projecting out and causing me to see war sickness, hospitals full of people, my parents dying, my dog getting run over. They're all coming from my negative deeds projecting outward. So it's very encouraging, back to the sales pitch, that if I can develop bodhicitta, then I can burn away all those bad deeds. We're gonna talk more about burning away bad deeds in the next class. Now there's some more metaphors here that come from the sutra called stocks in array. A sutra is a text or a verbal teaching actually given by Lord Buddha. It was written down later, but these are the direct words 
coming from the Buddha when it's called a sutra. Most of the time, their sutra can also mean a short book, like the Yoga Sutra was not spoken by Lord Buddha. That's just um, sutra in the sense of a short, short teaching. Uh, but for the most part, when you see sutra, that means it comes directly. It's not a commentary. So he says that the holy wish is like a seed, a rich field, a wish-giving vase, and a sword. So on your homework, it asks you to explain each of these. So let's just uh, think about it together. Now, why would it be like a seed? What do you think it's a seed for? A seed is going to be creating something new, growing something. It's like a seed because from it grow each and every quality of an enlightened being. We talked about that, how it's the bodhicitta which creates total enlightenment. Okay, and then why would it be a rich field? Again, it has this uh, metaphor, right, of like being able to grow or birth something amazing. It's a rich field. The wish is like a rich field of soil because it makes all the good qualities of living beings grow and increase. That's that self-perpetuating upward spiral. You can put these answers in your own words. Um, I did take these mostly from the answer key, might've changed them slightly. But think about each one of these. You can meditate on these. C, oh, sorry, I forgot to have, give us the time to think. A wish-giving vase. Okay, here we are to the wish-giving part. The thing about when we are given a wish-giving vase or a wish-giving jewel is we don't really know what to ask for. Should we ask for more chocolate cake? Should we ask, you know, our minds just go to like, what could I ask for that would make me and my family more comfortable? It's hard to even imagine how we could change the whole world. But bodhicitta is going to fulfill every wish. So you could wish, if you could rub the, wish granting bays and ask it to give you bodhicitta and then you would really be able to help because you could fulfill your every wish and others. There's an emphasis that uh, being able to achieve your worldly goals will happen and should happen as you're achieving your highest goals of reaching total enlightenment. So don't take my word for it that this is a path that's gonna you know, get you everything you want but you can try it. And uh, I think you'll find that your life gets better and better and things around you get better and better as this upward spiral starts happening. And the wish is like a spear because you can use it to defeat the enemy of anything related to the mental afflictions. So that's back to the warrior image. The warrior protects, um, the warrior also can attack mental afflictions, which our mental afflictions are causing other people pain and ourselves pain. So we want to uh, we want to spear those mental afflictions and get rid of them forever so we can become an arhat and a Buddha. The last two questions on the homework, we've already covered, we've already talked about them a little bit. So let's just review, make sure that we're clear on them. Um, one of them is how does the wish destroy bad deeds and prevent a lower rebirth? So we really didn't talk about the um, lower rebirth part, but how does the wish destroy bad deeds? Well, we know that when we have the wish to help others, that then we start looking for a way to do that. So by... Uh, by stopping to create negative karma and starting to plant positive karma, it will do these things. It will destroy bad deeds and it will prevent us from going down again because we change our karmic, our collection of karma. We're gonna talk a lot more about negative deeds in the next class, uh, the class number four, class number four and five are about um, how to destroy bad deeds. But having the wish um, is going to uh, 
um, cause us to want to end those negative deeds. And we're gonna use the four powers to do that. And we're gonna learn those a little bit later. And we're creating good karma. One of the ways is by taking vows and keeping our vows carefully. So that's uh, question five is we create good karma by keeping our vows carefully. We end our negative deeds using the four powers, but we wanna do it because we wanna reach total enlightenment for the benefit of others. And then question six, I, I really love this question. And that is um, the wish is to help an infinite, infinite number of beings. And we do that by being the highest kind of being we can conceive of. And it's these two very powerful ideas an infinite number of beings, the most number of beings we could possibly imagine and becoming the highest being we can imagine and holding those two things as how we can help the world. We can, we can help the world by becoming this highest being, help the infinite beings. The power of wanting to do that creates the karma for a pure world in the future. So it takes the power of these two things, wanting to help infinite beings and want, wanting to be the highest being you can. Putting that into action, uh, using the six perfections creates the karma for a pure world in your future. So I think that that is the end of the sales pitch for uh, Bodhicitta. And we'll be uh, stopping the recording and we might do a little bit of class three. We'll talk about that, but uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in and uh, look forward to seeing you again.